Today, the mobile operating system market is split between iOS and Android, but not so long ago, we still had Windows Phone. And the truth is, not many people realize the list doesn't end there. Back in the day, there were a ton of other alternatives, and what's really interesting is that a lot of those alternatives were actually super cool and forward-thinking. By the way, today's systems have borrowed a lot from the operating systems of the past. For example, the gesture controls that Apple prides itself on these days first showed up in Mego back in 2011. And the desktop mode that Windows Phone boasted about actually made its debut on Ubuntu Touch long before Windows gave it a try. Today, I want to tell you about some forgotten mobile operating systems, each unique in its own way. This is going to be interesting. Get comfortable, we're getting started. I don't think there's any point in digging too deep into ancient history, so I'll start with the days of Windows Mobile and Symbian OS. These were the systems that really brought smart mobile devices to the mainstream. At first, they were called communicators, or pocket PCs, and only later did they earn the proud name smartphone. One of the first mobile operating systems for smartphones was Windows Mobile. Over the years, it was also known as Windows CE, Pocket PC 2000, or Pocket PC Edition. The very first version, Pocket PC 2000, was actually meant for PDAs, but before long, a few phones were running it too. The killer feature of Pocket PC 2000 was support for Microsoft Office apps, Word, Excel, and Outlook with the Pocket prefix. There was a mobile version of Internet Explorer called Pocket Internet Explorer. It supported stylus input with handwriting recognition and had an infrared port. For the time, this OS was seriously amazing, especially considering it hardly had any real competition. The system's development took a peculiar route. For most of its lifetime, Windows Mobile was targeted primarily at the business segment and corporate clients. Microsoft's programmers often pulled large chunks of code straight from the desktop windows, without putting much effort into optimizing it. As a result, the system got cumbersome, complicated, and pretty sloppy under the hood. In the end, it was unstable and resource-hungry. The final version, Windows Mobile 6.5.3, was released in 2010. After that, Microsoft shut the project down, replacing it with an entirely new OS built from scratch for mobile devices, Windows Phone. We won't focus too much on that one since many of you probably remember it well. For now, let's talk about Windows Mobile's main competitor, Symbian OS. Ah, my Symbian. Those were the days. The system was in development from 1997 to 2013. Over that time, it built up an enormous user base. Symbian powered some of the coolest Nokia smartphones, but other brands like Samsung, Sony Ericsson, Simons, Motorola, and even LG also used it. Thanks to its popularity, Symbian had a vast library of software. You could easily find an app for just about any task. On top of that, Symbian was a very fast and reliable system. Compared to its main competitor, Windows Mobile, Symbian was way less demanding on hardware. It managed RAM and processor time efficiently. Also, unlike Microsoft's OS, Symbian was almost immune to viruses. Personally, I loved Symbian for its multitasking and the way it could keep the right processes running in memory without killing them unnecessarily. On this front, modern OSs like iOS and Android took a long time to catch up with Symbian. But unfortunately, those modern systems were exactly what spelled the end for Symbian. Officially, support for the system lasted until 2013, but in reality, its last three years were kept alive artificially. Nokia realized that Symbian was headed for sunset and began releasing its most advanced devices on the MIMO platform. From 2005 to 2009, Nokia released a series of internet tablets, the Nokia 770, N800, N810, and N900, all running this unusual OS. What made it especially interesting was that it was based on the Debian Linux distribution, adapted for use on mobile devices. Android is also built on the Linux kernel, but MAMO is much closer in spirit to desktop Linux. Because of this, MAMO devices earned a ton of love and respect among tech enthusiasts. Even with a small user base, MAMO had a ton of software available. Porting a needed app from desktop Linux to MAMO was as easy as pie. 
Besides its rich selection of software, Memo also offered the best multitasking of its era. But as you can imagine, you can't build a mass market just on geeks, so the Memo project was quietly laid to rest. The legacy of this remarkable OS lived on in Mego. Mego was intended by its creators to be a universal platform for everything, from smart wearables to cars, TVs, and of course, smartphones. Mego was also an open source project based on Linux sources, but this time it wasn't a solo effort. A whole consortium of companies was involved. Industry giants like Nokia, Samsung, Cisco, Pioneer, Intel, AMD, ARM, and even car manufacturers like Renault, Hyundai, and Peugeot all had high hopes for Mego and invested resources in the project. In short, Mego was supposed to turn out to be a real gem of a system. It was meant to combine the best features of Nokia's Memo and Intel's Moblin, as well as ideas from Linux projects like Fedora, Debian, and Open's use. The system was designed to work across a wide range of devices. Each type of gadget would have its own Mego build with a dedicated interface, but everything would share a common core. The idea was that an app written for a Mego laptop could easily be ported to another device, like a TV or smartphone. The smartphone version of Mego featured an interface that ran very fast and smoothly. Its gesture control system was revolutionary for smartphones. You could control everything with swipes. It worked magically, smoothly, and quickly. Keep in mind that gesture controls in Mego were implemented back in 2011, at a time when neither Android nor iOS had even thought about it. The other strength of the OS was multitasking. It was just as full-featured as it was on Memo. However, only two devices were ever released with Mego, the Nokia N9 and Nokia N900. But it was only the Nokia N9 that actually made it onto store shelves. Sadly, by then, Stephen Elop, the infamous Trojan horse from Microsoft, had already started his work destroying Nokia. As CEO, he forced Nokia to abandon Mego and switch it to the wretched Windows platform. As a result, the Mego developer consortium fell apart after losing its key device manufacturer. In 2011, the developers responsible for Mego and Memo left Nokia and started their own company, Jala to continue working on the OS under a new name, Sailfish OS. Meanwhile, the remaining Mego developers at Intel and Samsung reorganized their efforts and named the project Tizen. By the way, Tizen and Sailfish are still around to this day. In 2013, Jola crowdfunded its first device running Sailfish OS. The next year, after releasing the Jola phone, the company raised money for the Jola tablet. Development of the system was in full swing. Sailfish incorporated all the strengths of Memo and Mego. It boasted awesome multitasking, ran smoothly, and was driven by gesture controls. What's more, Sailfish learned to run Android apps. Still, none of that saved it from a software shortage. Many Android apps just wouldn't run reliably, and some, like banking apps, wouldn't launch at all. Unfortunately, a lack of developer support has doomed many operating systems before, and Sailfish met almost the same fate. The system gradually started to fade away. But back in 2018, Russia needed a mobile OS independent from Western sanctions, and a year later, Rostelecom acquired a 75% stake in Jala. Sailfish underwent rebranding and became known as Aurora. Since then, several devices have been released on this Russian OS, but Aurora remains a niche product, primarily used in governmental and enterprise sectors within Russia. The second branch of Mego, called Tizen, is now mostly known to users as the OS for smart TVs and Samsung wearables. While Tizen was initially envisioned as a multi-platform operating system for everything from smartwatches to laptops, cameras, tablets, and smartphones, today its main applications are in Samsung smart TVs, wearables, and some smart home devices. To make this possible, developers created several system profiles, Tizen Wearable and Tizen Mobile. In the mobile version of Tizen, the developers moved away from gesture controls and made the system look as much like Android as possible. Samsung understood its own vulnerability and dependence on Android, so it saw Tizen as a backup plan. The Korean giant even realized a few smartphones on this OS, but these were limited batches for certain markets or developer devices. At the same time, Samsung was actively working on and developing another system, Bada. 
It also used a Linux kernel with the TouchWiz interface on top. Bada was a closed multi-platform system. It ran on smart TVs, wearables, and, of course, smartphones. Because it was a closed platform, developers weren't all that interested, and Samsung spent a lot of money keeping it alive. Supporting the project alone was getting expensive, so they decided to merge Bada with the more promising Tizen. Mass production of Tizen smartphones never happened. The system mostly found its place in wearables and smart TVs. As of now, Tizen powers Samsung smartwatches and TVs and is also used in some smart home devices, but the OS remains largely invisible to most consumers outside these product categories. But don't for a second think that's the whole list of operating systems. Canonical, known for its desktop Ubuntu Linux distribution, also tried to create its own mobile OS. In 2013, the first version of Ubuntu Touch mobile platform was released. You've probably already guessed that it was based on the Linux kernel. Ubuntu was also a gesture-focused system. It had multiple home screens that could adapt to the user's interests. There was also an interesting feature, a side menu. You could summon it by swiping from the left edge of the screen anywhere in the system, giving you quick access to favorite apps. But the main killer feature of the system was supposed to be desktop mode, something like Samsung DeX today. The Ubuntu developers were aiming really high. They wanted to give users a full-fledged Linux experience on their phone, not just a simple launcher like DeX with a handful of adapted apps. The idea from Canonical was, of course, very cool. Just imagine, you connect the keyboard and mouse to your smartphone and get a full operating system with loads of real desktop quality software, just like Linux on your PC. By 2016, Canonical managed to get the system working with monitors over the wireless Miracast protocol. It all looked really awesome in demos, but in practice it just didn't work as promised. Sadly, Canonical had bitten off more than it could chew, and didn't even manage to deliver a tenth of what was promised. Up until the official end of the project, Ubuntu Touch never really worked as intended. Even in its mobile version it lagged, stuttered, and still looked more like a concept than a finished product. The desktop version? It wasn't even worth mentioning. Ubuntu Touch was officially discontinued in 2017. However, a small community of enthusiasts, now coordinated by the UB Ports project, continues its development, keeping the spirit of mobile Linux alive, though it remains a niche among enthusiasts. Personally, I find it fascinating to watch manufacturers develop desktop modes for their devices. I would really love to see the power of today's flagships put to full use as desktop PCs. Firefox OS is another mobile operating system that has gone to tech heaven, but left behind some ideas that have since taken off. Firefox OS was based on the OpenGecko engine. In concept, Firefox OS was a lot like Chrome OS. Both systems run web apps instead of native ones, basically adapted websites made for touch controls. The main difference is that Firefox OS had a more open structure and was originally intended for smartphones, tablets, and smart TVs, while Chrome OS is more of a laptop system. Firefox OS introduced the idea and concept of a cloud operating system, where you don't need powerful hardware or a lot of memory on your device. All you really need is a stable connection and a solid browser. Your data and apps can be stored and processed on powerful remote servers. You can use the OS browser to access them. For years, more and more tasks have shifted from local devices to the cloud. Google Docs, for example, transformed the Office suite landscape. Today, even high-end AAA games can be streamed via cloud gaming services, letting you play directly in a browser or on nearly any device. Unfortunately, Firefox OS never really managed to make this concept work. BlackBerry OS X was introduced in 2012. It focused on gesture control, fast performance, security, and improved multitasking. BlackBerry OS X was a fascinating system in its own right. What set it apart was how completely different it was under the hood compared to the rest. Most of the OSs we've talked about are based on monolithic Linux kernels, but BlackBerry OS X is a microkernel Unix system. What does that mean in practice? Well, the Unix kernel is made up of individual modules, so developers can disable any features they don't need. This modularity makes Unix systems light, reliable, and really fast. That's why their technology is used as a backbone for systems where reliability and resiliency are crucial. 
for example, in engineering or the aerospace industry. BlackBerry OS X was really fast, robust, and a joy to use, but unfortunately it didn't have enough support from third-party developers, even though it could run Android apps. The other reason for the OS's demise was the financial collapse of RIM, which is a shame because BlackBerry OS X was a really great system. As you can see, many of these forgotten operating systems were cool and unique in their own ways. They brought interesting and game-changing technologies into the world. And it's great that some of their features and ideas have made their way into modern Android and iOS, but back then we had real competition. And that competition benefited us, the end users. Today, iOS and Android still dominate the world of mobile operating systems. Both continue to borrow features from each other, and while they do evolve, true innovation has slowed, with most alternatives now existing only in niche or enthusiast communities. In this video, to keep it concise, we skipped over some less prominent but still interesting systems like Palm OS, QNX, Moblin, Limo, Mer, and OpenMoco. Most of these have also faded further into obscurity, serving mostly as reference points for tech history or open source experiments. If you've ever used any of these systems, share your impressions in the comments.